All right, if you would turn with me today to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 10 today. That's right, good job, Mama. I heard that. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? You know, in church, we say that. As Christians, we believe that. But if somebody was to ask you, what does it mean that Jesus died for your sins? Could you answer that? What does the atonement mean? That's a word we don't usually use in normal speech, atonement. You know, the atonement was when we were able to have our relationship with God restored because of what Jesus did on the cross, dying for our sins. The word atone literally means to cover. Think about Jesus' blood covering our sins. The atonement. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? As the Jewish people had their sacrificial system, they were continually reminded that sin equals death. And Yom Kippur, which was the Day of Atonement, was a special day once a year that the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies. And they made a sacrifice for the people, for the sin. Not only for the people, but for the tabernacle as well, because sin had tainted everything. Do you understand that sin has tainted the world that we're in, not just our lives? Sin has a negative effect on everything. But sin equals death, and they were reminded of that over and over again with the sacrificial system. Take for a moment just to think about the scene in the tabernacle or in the temple. You know, the smell of all the different animals, but not just animals that are alive, but also the smell of blood and guts and all the things that come with sacrifice. The smell of all the different incenses that they were burning in the temple. All the different sounds that were certainly there in the temple. Think about that. Think about how that really made them reflect upon what sacrifice meant. That sin equals death. And the Day of Atonement was a yearly activity, but sacrifices were going on in the temple and the tabernacle daily. If someone was to sin, they were to bring a sacrifice to the temple daily. It was just a constant reminder that they were unholy and that God is holy. We need that constant reminder, don't we? That we are unholy. That we fall short of God's glory. Why did Jesus die for our sins? It was because we are unholy. It was because He did something that we could not do. Living the perfect life, completely fulfilling the law... And died in our place. Think about a car wreck. Think about if you were driving a car and you caused a car wreck. But here's the thing. When you caused that car wreck, when you crushed that other person's car, you crushed your car, and now you have injured yourself very badly in this wreck. But you don't have any insurance at all. There is no way you're going to be able to pay your hospital bills. There's no way you're going to be able to pay for that other car or your car. But then the victim, the person that's completely innocent in this scene comes up and he says, I'm going to pay for your hospital bill. I'm going to pay for your car to be fixed. I'm going to pay for my car to be fixed. You see, the victim here didn't ignore the fact that there was injury because of the wreck. The victim stepped up and paid for the situation. And that's exactly what it's like with Jesus. You see, we are that, one, that person driving the car without insurance. We're causing wrecks in our life because of sin. We've even impacted God because of our sin. He's that innocent victim there. The innocent victim. And there's no way we could pay for our recovery. There's no way we could pay to fix all the things that we've messed up because of sin. But that victim, God steps up and says, I'm going to pay it all. See, he didn't ignore our sin. He said, I'm going to pay it all. In His holiness, He could not ignore the fact that we had sin in our lives. So God the Son came in the flesh and took the punishment for us. He did not ignore sin. He paid for it fully. That's what it means for Jesus to die for our sins. That's what it means to atone for us. That He has restored that relationship. And that our sin is covered because of what Jesus has done. Look here in Levit Leviticus 16, 6-10. This is talking about the Day of Atonement. It says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. 
And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. Lord, I thank you for this day being able to gather together and look at your word. I pray that you help us to have that constant reminder of the fact that we are unworthy, we are unholy, but you have done it all for us. You have drawn us to you. You have restored the relationship by dying on the cross for our sins. And I pray as we look at your word today, understand how full, how full and accomplished and done the sacrifice is. That we don't make sacrifices daily, yearly, that it was once and done the better sacrifice. I thank you that Jesus is that high priest, that he is that prophet, that he is that king, that he is that sacrifice for us. Guide us as we look at your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the high priest here was Aaron. And if you remember, Aaron was Moses' brother. And Aaron, just like us, was not a perfect person. Aaron was the first high priest. And this is interesting too, Think about what Aaron did when the Israelites first came out of Egypt. When Moses was up on the mountain, they started griping and complaining. Isn't that just like people? We get together and we gripe and complain. And Aaron said, give me your gold and I'll make a golden calf for you. And they gave him his gold and he shaped the golden calf. Then when Moses came down and saw what had happened, he said, what have you done? And Aaron said, well, I just stuck this, this gold in the oven and out came a calf. He didn't want to admit it. But this is the man that's serving as the high priest. You see how God uses all of us. Even in our shortcomings, God uses us. But see, this high priest, he couldn't just go and do the service automatically. He had to be cleansed. He had to have a sacrifice even for himself before he could make a sacrifice for the people. That's why the high priest had to have this bull to sacrifice first. So the high priest had to go through a ritual of cleansing, a bath, changing his garments into a special linen garment. So the high priest was not sinless. The high priest had to have his sins forgiven as well. So the first sacrifice was this bull that he had to bring. This bull had to die in his place. And you see, Jesus Christ, he not only is our sacrifice, but he also is our high priest. But unlike Aaron, Jesus was sinless. Jesus did not have to bring a sacrifice for himself before he could do what he did for us on the cross. You see, Jesus was sinless. He's our high priest that lives forevermore. And he can sympathize with our weaknesses, with our temptations. See, Aaron was tempted. Aaron sinned. But Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He understands the struggles that we go through. He understands choices. He understands what we go through in the human experience. He is our great high priest, but sinless. He perfectly understands exactly what God desires of us. God the Son in the flesh. And see, this high priest, he could not in enter into the Holy of Holies presumptuously. He had to prepare himself. And one thing he had to do was have a pot of coals, basically. A smoking censer when he went into the Holy of Holies. So he would not look upon God. Can you imagine how that high priest felt? Every year. This is the only time he got to go into the Holy of Holies. The Day of Atonement. He would walk in. How intense would that be to go into the Holy of Holies? This was a special place where God's presence dwelled. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was at. And it was had a veil in front of it. A huge veil that he'd have to go through. And no one else could go in there with him at all. He would go in there to make these sacrifices. And there upon the ark is the mercy seat. The lid of the ark. And if you remember inside the ark, the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone that God had written with His own hand were there inside of the ark. And the mercy seat was basically like God's throne. And God's presence was there in a very special way. And like a cloud, a cloud appearance there. And the people could not go into the Holy of Holies lest they die. The high priest could not go into the Holy of Holies until he did all the things that God had commanded of him to be cleansed, to make the sacrifice for himself and for his family before he could even serve in the role of high priest there. You see, Jesus, he went beyond that veil. Jesus, when he died on the cross, the veil was torn. 
showing that we now have access to God in a new way. The veil was torn, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. God ripped it open to allow new access. And everything in the sanctuary, everything in this tabernacle, in the temple there, was basically symbolic of heaven. Symbolic of heaven. And Christ, our great high priest, has entered into the heavenly sanctuary. See, blood had to be sacrificed. A bull had to be sacrificed for the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus gave his own blood, his own body on the cross to be able to enter into that heavenly temple. And the high priest acted as an intercessor, a mediator for the people. And this is exactly what Jesus does today. As he is there in heaven, as the devil accuses us of many, many things, there's Jesus standing, fighting for us. He's an intercessor, a mediator, saying, I hear your accusations, devil, but I know my child. I know my child's heart. And I know that my child is forgiven because of what I have done on the cross. Jesus has died for our sins. And the resurrection, we know the resurrection is so important. For us to understand. It proves that Jesus is who he says he is. And the fact that he rose from the dead to never die again. He is our great high priest as eternal. You realize he's always standing there mediating for us. To be our intercessor because he is never to die again. Aaron died. All the high priests after him died. But Jesus is never to die again. He rose from the dead. And he's our great high priest. So what does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? Well, first, he's the high priest. He's got to bring this sacrifice for the people there. And we know that he is a sacrifice. Over and over again, the Israelites received object lessons. In the sacrificial system, in the tabernacle, in the temple, they had object lessons about the Messiah, about what needed to be done. But the blood of bulls and goats never saved them from their sins. That's why we needed a better sacrifice. We needed Jesus Christ. And this sin offering. So there's two goats that are brought for the people there. And Aaron would cast a lot, or the high priest would cast a lot for these two goats. And one would be a sin offering and one would be a scapegoat. Look at verse 9 there. So Aaron, he's able to bring this sacrifice now because he's already made the sacrifice for his own sins with the bull. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. So this was yearly the day of atonement. This was for unacknowledged sins because sacrifices continued to happen in the temple year round. Year round. If you sinned, you brought a lamb. You brought a turtle dove. Whatever it may have been for your sins. But here was a sacrifice for all the people. A sacrifice for the whole community there. For all these unacknowledged sins. All these sins that we commit daily. I think we all can recognize that, that we fall short every single day. And this was a special yearly occurrence. And they had to have a lamb without blemish. A lamb without blemish that was a substitute for the people. Because sin equals death. And you see, Jesus is that lamb without blemish. Without sin that died in our place. It's so important for us to understand substitute. This lamb... This goat died in the place of the Israelites. Jesus died in our place. He is our substitute. That's what it means that Jesus died for our sins as our substitute in our place. And whenever this sin offering was offered by the high priest, he would take the blood into the Holy of Holies and he would put it on the mercy seat. If you remember, that's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And under the lid there are the Ten Commandments. The blood is covering the law. You see, that Ten Commandments, we never could fulfill it. The law showed us that we fell short. The law reveals to us that we need a Savior. That we need a sacrifice. And when God looked down upon that mercy seat, He saw the blood covering the law that the Israelites had broken. And when He looks at us, when we stand before God one day, if we have accepted Jesus, Jesus' blood is covering all of that law. All of those times we have fallen short of God's glory, covering it all. If you remember, atone means to cover. Jesus' blood is covering it all. And that atonement that happened yearly was only for those people that had genuine faith. 
You see, God did forgive the Israelites if they had genuine faith, if they trusted that He could forgive sins. But the sacrifice was done for all people. And see, this is the same thing as Jesus on the cross. He died for all people. But genuine faith is the only thing that will save us. That we trust that sacrifice. That we trust what Jesus has done. They were doing it every single year. They were doing sacrifices daily. But Jesus was once and for all. And the forgiveness, even of the Israelites, was due to Jesus' work. Did you realize that? We wonder sometimes about the Old Testament saints. How were they saved? Well, they had faith that God was going to do something about their sins. And God counted it to them as righteousness. God knew that He would send His Son to die on the cross for our sins one day. And that is by Jesus' work that even the Old Testament saints were saved. It's not by the blood of bulls or goats. It is only by Jesus' sacrifice. Because if it was by the blood of bulls and goats, it wouldn't have gone on year after year after year. Jesus died one time, once and for all. The death of the goats and bulls were a constant reminder to the Israelites, again, that they were unholy. But Christ is complete. That atonement is once and for all. He gave His life a ransom, a substitute for us. That car analogy that I mentioned at the beginning, the car wreck. You see, He was a substitute. We caused the wreck we could not afford to fix the cars. We could not afford to fix ourselves. But here the victim, Jesus dying in our place as our substitute, He stepped up and paid it all. Paid it all. Because God cannot, God will not overlook sin. In His holiness, something has to be done about sin. He doesn't just turn, the other, he doesn't just turn away from our sins. No, the only way for us to be saved is something to be done about our sins. If you remember, sin equals death. And that's what Jesus has done on the cross. Death was how the ancient people would enter into covenants, into agreements. And it seems kind of foreign to us now. When we read in Leviticus, when we read in the Old Testament about the sacrifices, it seems very foreign to us to think about an animal being killed to make an agreement with somebody. To make a covenant with somebody. But you realize that we still have things like that today. Another word for covenant is testament. You know, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Agreement, the New Agreement. The New Covenant and the Old Covenant. And today, people have their last will and testament. Their last will and agreement. And when do you receive that inheritance? It's that when that person dies. That's when that agreement, that testament is ratified is at the death, is when you receive the inheritance. And that's the same way for Jesus. For us to have this new covenant, there had to be death. For us to be able to inherit Jesus' righteousness, there had to be death. And that's what the cross did for us. That's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Now we are children of God because of what He has done. He has done something that we could not do for ourselves. And then the scapegoat. This is a word that we may use sometimes. Scapegoat. But we don't often talk about it in the Bible. Verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. So there were two goats here. And they were both symbolic. So one was a sin offering showing that sin equals death. The blood covered the broken law. And now we have the scapegoat that's alive. This goat, they would lay their hands upon it and confess the sins of the people on this goat. They were basically transferring their guilt for the sins and then they would send it outside of the camp. This is what the scapegoat was doing, was taking their sins far, far away from them. And we don't know from just reading scripture here exactly what happened to the scapegoat other than they released it into the wilderness. But other Jewish writings said they would often take this scapegoat to a cliff and push him off backwards. The scapegoat was never coming back. And he was outside of the camp to take the sins far, far away. Outside the camp was very important because they did not want to defile the camp. They did not want to defile the tabernacle. So they took the scapegoat with the sins outside of the camp. And those offerings, after the sin offering was killed, it was burnt outside of the camp. Remove the defilement from the camp. And this is what happened with Jesus. 
He did not die inside of the temple. He did not die inside of Jerusalem, but outside of the camp on the cross, Golgotha. Symbolic in so many ways when we look through Leviticus here. But that scapegoat was blamed. He was punished for the sins of the people. They transferred their guilt and sent that scapegoat far, far away. And that's what we need to remember about what Jesus has done for us. He is like that scapegoat. He's taken our sins far, far away, as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? We can't even calculate that. As far as the east is from the west. But us as Christians, we like to hold on to things, don't we? We like to continue to beat ourselves up about something that God has done perfectly, completely. In Christ, we need to stop with this guilt because Jesus has done it all for us. We cannot save ourselves at all. Jesus is the only way. He is that scapegoat taking our sins away. He is that sin sacrifice. You see, he is the high priest. He had to bring the sacrifice, but he didn't have to make a sacrifice for himself because he was sinless. But that high priest brought a sacrifice for the people. And Jesus' sacrifice was himself on the cross. But he was sinless. We transferred our guilt to him. And he died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. This is how we know that that sacrifice was fully accepted. Now his blood covers all our sins. He is an eternal high priest. Alive forevermore to make intercession. To be a mediator for us. And that sacrifice is once and complete. Don't try to crucify Jesus over and over again. When you come to Him, when you trust Him for salvation, it is done. It is done. There's nothing you can do to work your way into heaven. What Jesus did on the cro cross was completely sufficient. God's wrath was poured out. Upon Jesus because of our sins. Fully, fully satisfied. So salvation is one and done. The atonement. Why did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? It was to cover our sins. It was to restore our relationship with God once again. Going back to the car wreck analogy. This is what sin is. Sin is us driving recklessly through life. And we hit others. We destroy others' lives. And we injure ourselves. And here we are in the midst of this car wreck. And we have no way to pay. We didn't have insurance. We didn't have insurance at all. But Jesus stepped up. The victim. You see God didn't just send a random person to die on the cross for our sins. It didn't work that way. God the Son himself took the punishment that we deserve on the cross. That's what it means that Jesus died for our sins as a substitute. As a substitute. Something that no one else could ever do. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. I pray that you just continue to focus upon Him. And if there's anyone here today that has not accepted Jesus as your Savior, realize you cannot save yourself. You don't have any insurance. You don't have any way to get into heaven without Jesus Christ. He is the only way to heaven. And maybe there's some here today that would like to come and join our church. Maybe God is leading you here to be part of our congregation. We're going to have a closing song in just a moment. And if you feel like God wants you to come and join our congregation, or if there's something that you want to come and confess today, don't wait. Don't wait. We're not promised tomorrow. Today is the day of your salvation. And today is the day that we can push that guilt aside, realizing that our sins are as far as the east from the west away from us. Don't continue to live defeated, but live in victory. Lord, I thank you for your word today. And I thank you for that sacrifice on the cross, doing something that we could not do for ourselves, fully taking your wrath for our sins. And now we have the hope of eternal life. If we just come to you in faith. If we trust that you have done something about our sins. One sacrifice. One and done. Not a yearly reminder. And I pray you just continue to help us to trust you. Don't allow us to continue to carry that guilt. Knowing that you have dealt with it fully. On the cross. And I pray that if there is anyone here today that has not accepted you. 
That you would just speak to their hearts. That you would convict them of their sins. No one can be saved until they understand that they are lost. And we have all sinned and fall short of your glory. Guide us, direct us, and help us bring honor to your name wherever we are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.